Okay. I'll, uh, I'll now call to order this uh, regular meeting of the Mount Pleasant City Commission this July 27th, 2020. And we can stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk, has the roll been taken? It has. All are present tonight. Okay. Uh, tonight, we do have a departmental presentation by police records supervisor, uh, Christy Dush, and I believe we have a recorded um, presentation, and Christy is with us on the call to answer any questions. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christy Dush, and I'm the record supervisor for the City of Mount Pleasant's Department of Public Safety. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the police records section. The Department of Public Safety's police records section has five police records professionals and one record supervisor. This next slide shows just a few of the many duties our police records professionals handle on a day-to-day -day basis. They greet and assist our citizens via phone calls or when they walk into our lobby. They are a support system for our officers and our administrative staff. They transcribe and process police reports. They also process our citations and our crash reports. They are responsible for the entry of warrants, missing persons, and protective conditions into the law enforcement information network also known as lean. They enter stolen guns, stolen vehicles, and property into the law enforcement information network. Once entered into the law enforcement information network, these records are available statewide and often nationwide by other police agencies. They process abandoned vehicles and the associated paperwork. They assist the public with firearms purchase permits. And then when the citizen brings back the paperwork, those guns are entered into the My Pistol system, which is a statewide network. They prepare Freedom of Information Act requests, and they respond to a multitude of background and records check requests. They enter sex offenders into the sex offender registry and complete annual verifications and updates. They do all of these plus much more while monitoring our police radio, our resource monitor, and our lean computer for administrative messages that may come from other area police agencies. This shows a condensed version of the steps involved in our police report process. We start by transcribing or typing the report and end by filing the report in the archives, which is filed by year and in numerical order. To give you just a glimpse of the complete process, the main section on police reports in our training manual is 33 pages long. Our police records professionals are trained and versed in many computer and software programs that are specialized to police records. As you can see, being a police records professional is not a typical clerical position. Not only must you be organized and have good grammar skills, you must be able to maintain confidentiality, make quick decisions, have good reasoning skills, and be able to work under pressure during an in-progress incident. Thank you for the opportunity this evening to give you a little bit of information and insight into what it is like to be a police records professional for the Mount Pleasant Department of Public Safety. Okay, thank you for that very nice presentation. Is there any questions for um, 
Christy while she's here with us. All right, without any hands, um, Christy, thank you for your presentation. Did you have any, uh, I guess, last words for us before um, we move on to our census update? I think I'm all set. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk a little bit about our department this evening. Well, thank you very much. Um, next on our agenda is a, presenta or a presentation by Jeremy Howard, our city clerk, on a census update. Yes, so it's been a little bit since we've uh, had an opportunity to do a census update. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of information just kind of on some of the things we've done since then and then some of our plans for the fall. So as a reminder to, uh, to you and to everybody else that's out watching or will be watching, the uh, deadline has been extended for uh, the census until October 31st, 2020. So everybody still has plenty of time to be able to fill that out. Currently, the city is sitting at 59% self-response rate, and uh, that continues to climb as some more and more people fill that out. And as a reminder, even if you were a student and you were not living in Mount Pleasant on April 1st due to uh, COVID and uh, some of the issues that were related to that, you can still fill out your census for you and your roommates and uh, show that you were intending to be living on April 1st in the city of Mount Pleasant. Um, as you all know, most of our spring events got canceled, but we were able to get a lot of our stuff still used. So we were able to get out 50,000 napkins to some of the Mount Pleasant School for some of their lunches that they were doing. And then also uh, to 20 different restaurants for some of their takeout and deliveries. Uh, we were able to get rid of our koozies that we had ordered and those were um, given to uh, the liquor stores. So liquor stores were able to distribute those. And uh, our fidget spinners are actually being distributed some at the farmer's market. So we're getting some of those out that way. Uh, the chapstick and hand sanitizer that you all saw and got some of those, um, we're able to get most of those actually distributed. And then we do have quite a few t-shirts because we were planning on doing a lot of stuff with t-shirts. So we're still looking at some ways to distribute those. Um, we continue to coordinate with Isabella County Census Advisory Group. And uh, we were able to partner with them and get some billboards and some bus wraps. So Hopefully you've seen those around town. Uh, we were able to send out a landlord email text uh, so that they could send that out, giving their tenants back in April some information uh, to catch some of the students before they left in April on where to be counted and why they should be counted in Mount Pleasant. Uh, we did do some radio ads that ran pretty much every day for the month of April and May on WCZY and WMMI and those um, ran pretty constantly. And then we actually had two live on air interviews as well that were done. We had continuous social media posts uh, as we had those going out. Uh, those were pretty regular. Um, we did see a, uh, a pretty good turnout on our census chalk event that we had in the month of June. And that was uh, where we actually had citizens uh, be able to submit their pictures of chalk art that they did and they were entered into a drawing. So that was a Facebook event that we were able to get um, some nice participation in and we drew winners at the end of every week for those pictures. And there were some really nice pictures. If you go out and check those out on the Parks and uh, Recreation Facebook page, you'll be able to see those. The farmer's market has been good. They've actually agreed to uh, wear some t-shirts. We gave them some t-shirts and some buttons. So um, hopefully they're uh, able to wear those sometimes out there. And then uh, we did, like I said, give them some fidget spinners so that they can hand those out to some of the kids that come to the farmer's market as well. Uh, we're hoping that maybe we can even get some signage out there and have some information uh, on kind of sandwich board kind of sign as well at the farmer's market during their normal days. So the fall strategy is where we're kind of concentrating now, now that we have this extension of the deadline so everybody should be receiving, um, almost every household who has not had a response yet should be receiving a postcard in the mail from the Census Bureau. And I actually just got some communication today saying that they're actually gonna be trying to do some emails um, starting this week and then throughout the, the month of September. So uh, if they have those contacts, I think you might even get an email if you haven't responded yet. So make sure that you do uh, either of those things and get that signed out or filled out if you uh, get those communications. The Census Bureau does plan on having on-site workers, so they will be doing door-to-door -door, um, visits for non-responsive households, 
and that should begin, they're saying, between August 11th and October 31st will be their time frame for some of those door knocking on the non-responsive. And that actually will include the student housing neighborhoods and apartments um, they have said as well. So that's a, a good thing that they're including those um, again. The Census Bureau actually contacted CMU and we've been in um, quite a few conversations with CMU and uh, um, trying to figure out exactly how the group quarters uh, enumeration works, which you know, as I've talked about before, group quarters typically counts those living on campus, but CMU was contacted and they are actually going to be counting the off-campus students as well. So CMU was able, we got confirmation that they were able to submit those numbers of um, off-campus students to the actual database. And uh, we don't know what that number was, but we did get confirmation that that number was submitted. So hopefully they will be able to look at and kind of cross-reference if a student was counted in another city and they have them on the list in this database, they'll be able to pull them out of that other city and put them correctly in Mount Pleasant and then be able to use some of those local addresses that are in that database as well. So that's moving forward. And that's a new thing that uh, the Census Bureau has never tried. So they're uh, innovating and moving along in their process. Um, we continue to partner with CMU on some other things too. We're hoping this fall we can get some um, support from President Davies, maybe to send out another email. Uh, they did some of that for us in the past, uh, earlier this year, and we hope to maybe get them to do that again and possibly even put some stuff on their social media channels or on campus messaging systems. Uh, once SGA, SGA gets back into full swing, um, we're going to try and partner with them, maybe get to, to one of their meetings to share some information with uh, SGA as well. As far as the traditional walk around welcome weekend, uh, we will actually have some census information, some door tags that will be able to be uh, handed out in that normal walk around. And that will allow us to get some information uh, in those neighborhoods that we typically do the walk arounds in. And then we're actually planning an expanded walk around in late August that will allow us to take city staff, the complete count committee, and likely some other staff um, based on the number of units uh, we have uh, kind of identified about 2,000 plus units in student housing inside the city that we'd like to try to, to door knock and get door hangers on and get that information to them. So trying to hit that student population, which is everybody knows the, the population is that it is the hardest to count. And the Census Bureau has said that from the beginning. And based on some of the numbers that we've seen, uh, we believe that to be our, our main focus. Um, we'll continue. We're going to do some new radio ads actually on some more radio stations, WCFX, WCZY, WMMI. So we'll have those moving through probably in August and September. And then we're looking at uh, the same time frame, time frame in August and September to be doing some online and print ads with CM Life in the Morning Sun as well to be able to get that information in front of as many people as we can, especially those students. We have some more hand sanitizer coming. We finally got uh, a company that actually had some hand sanitizer. So we, we've got another order of that coming and that I'm sure will go fast <laughs> in the times we're living in. So that's uh, you know, surprisingly uh, the hottest topic or hottest piece of a, a giveaway that we've had. So uh, that's a good thing that we were finally able to get some. Uh, we also ordered another 50,000 napkins. We're going to try to get those out to some more restaurants and bars and uh, get those in front of people as far as uh, bar napkins or takeout napkins. Uh, we'll be checking with some other businesses. We've got a couple other ideas to try to partner with on uh, some other things, but uh, as you can imagine, we're having um, some difficulty. A lot of businesses are, are under pressure and stress right now, just trying to make ends meet. So we're not trying to add any pressure to any of these businesses, but if they are uh, able to partner with us on some of these things, uh, we'll certainly do that. And then we'll continue to look for opportunities to give away the t-shirts. The so if you've got any ideas there, I, I'm all ears. And you know, we'll continue to do um, sporting events. If it works out, the CMU is able to actually have some, some more in-person sporting events. That's where we got rid of a bunch of them to begin with. So we're hopeful that that uh, might be a possibility. And then we'll continue our social media outreach and our newsletters and all of our normal paths um, as we move through uh, the end of October. And then um, we're actually trying to work with some of the reporters too. I know the mayor has done an op-ed and so we're looking at maybe doing an op-ed in both of the papers, hopefully that uh, would come from the complete count committee. So we'll have some other angles that we can get that information out. So that's kind of our fall plan and some of the, the stuff that we've done so far. Thank you, Jeremy. That was a very informative report. And uh, I, think, I think it felt uh, that we're in a positive direction with the census and 
Um, obviously, a lot of obstacles to overcome this year. Yep. Um, are there any questions for Jeremy? Uh, Commissioner Gillis? Um, yeah, I had mentioned last commission meeting about setting up booths at the voting precincts or a table for census. Yeah, uh, we had checked on that. It actually, it falls under um, campaigning. So we wouldn't actually be able to have anything inside the precincts. So if anybody were to set something up, it would have to fall under the same rule. So you have that 100 foot rule where you know, would have to be 100 feet from the door of the precinct. So at this point, we're not um, planning on doing that just partly because I don't have enough election workers to, <laughs> to, to staff something like that. Um, so we don't have any plans right now to have any information at the polls. Um, but that uh, is something we couldn't do inside. Okay. Um, and another idea was, and correct me if my if I'm wrong, if anyone knows this, graduation was going to happen at our football stadium for the high school. Was that last week? Does anyone know if that was last Thursday or this Thursday? Sure. Uh, Okay. Well, I was just thinking that might be another avenue of where we could set up a table because all of those people are obviously within our community if they're sending the kids to the high school and, and the families. So, um, but, sorry, I'm not sure if it was this Thursday or last Thursday that that happened. Mr. Ronan? Yeah, I, I, I was just asking for a point of clarification, sort of. What does it mean when the university notifies them of the students? That you said that's something new this year? I didn't quite track it. So are they literally giving names of students so that we don't have to hunt them down? Or is it something different? Yeah, that's the new piece of um, group quarters. Typically only they supply the, the names and addresses of the students who are living on campus. So that's typically the extent of when you're talking about that group quarters automatic um, count. So they've expanded that and the Census Bureau has asked CMU to provide a list of all students. So all registered students, off-campus students. So somebody who's living on Main Street or Washington or in an apartment complex. So they're supplying all of those names and addresses. It still is a little bit remains to see, you know, what they're going to do with that information. But I know um, based on talking with um, Sean Holbrief, he said they actually had full access to the database and were able to put that information right into the census database. So he was hopeful that that count will, will certainly help. Okay. Uh, Jeremy, could you just repeat the, uh, the new deadline for filling out the census again? It is through October. So October 31st of 2020. Okay. Thank you. Um, doesn't look like we have uh, any more questions for you. So I appreciate your presentation and uh, continue to keep up the great work. All right. uh, thank, thank you. you. Yep. Uh, next, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda tonight? Okay. Uh, next, we can go into our public input section on agenda items. And it does not appear that we have anyone from the public in our meeting tonight. Um, Manager Ridley, do we have any emailed comments on agenda items tonight? No, we do not, Mayor. Okay. And then next we can go to our receipt of petitions and communications. And I will hand that off to Manager Ridley. Thank you, Mayor. For this section of the agenda tonight, we have your um, regular report on pending items. And then attached to that is a special report that we provided to you. And as you know, towards the end of June, Governor Whitmer issued some um, ideas that she had regarding police reform that might be needed in the state of Michigan. So the report that's attached to the pending items report is from Director Loria. And that gives you a high level overview of where our Mount Pleasant Police Department is already engaged in some of those areas to give you an idea of what we're doing currently in some of those areas um, and the things that we will continue to look toward as we get additional information from the governor and from the state. 
as well as the ongoing commitment to continue to implement those best practices and comply with any reforms that come along. And so that report just is to give you a snapshot of the, as a picture in time. And um, when I get done with this section, certainly if you have any questions for Director Lawyer, I'm sure he would be happy to answer any of those, but I'll run through the rest of these real quick. We also have the second quarter investment report, the June minutes of the traffic control committee, the May minutes of the planning commission, the May minutes of the economic development corporation and Brownfield redevelopment authority. And then you had a communication in your packet from Mr. Jake way regarding um, the solid waste ordinance that you have a public hearing on tonight. And then also today I received a written communication from Mr. Mount Satson and um, I will just read that briefly because I didn't have a chance to get it out to you today, but his um, written communication to us again is in regard to the solid waste ordinance. And he, he had had a couple communications with Jason Moore and myself and his written communication is, I appreciate you both getting back to me regarding the solid waste issue in the city. I can only speak for myself and Mount Satson rentals, but I think the system that I have had and will be able to continue to have thanks to your confirmation email of today is the best policy and process for my property in which to maintain an efficient, safe and healthy manner in which to service my refuse needs. I thank you both for your assistance in this regard. And again, that's in relation to the proposed changes that you will be considering tonight. So those are the items we have under petitions and communications. Thank you very much, Manager Ridley. Um, I see a couple hands up. Um, Commissioner Alsager. Mary, you are, you are muted. Thank you. Um, just one thing I noticed with the various reports is some of the groups put um, first names and last names and some including ours just give last names, you know, perhaps with a title and as I look over some of the reports, we have some kind of common area last names, which leads me to be a little bit confused about who's actually on these commissions. So I'm, I just, I guess I'm making a recommendation that when you take the roll call, that maybe it's first and last name, and then in the subsequent minutes, just use last names. That might lend towards better clarity of who's actually on these commissions. That was my only comment. I will pass that on to each of the staff liaisons. Commissioner Alsager, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Commissioner Gillis. I would just like to thank Director Loria for the complete and accurate description of the police policies and um, how we are complying with uh, Governor Whitmer's new direction. Um, I have complete confidence in our law enforcement and staff, and I think it's a wonderful report for um, not only us for information, but for our community members. So thank you. Commissioner Ronan. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to do the, say the same thing to Director Loria for the report. I, I think it just makes our job easier. You know, I've got a lot of questions about um, what training the police are getting. And, you know, there's all this stuff going on nationally. And it was such a thorough and detailed report. It just makes it, um, you know, it just shows all the great stuff you're doing. And um, I, I hope it's made public so that, um, you know, people have access to it. It was pretty sophisticated, actually. So I don't know. Uh, and I would mention, Commissioner Ronan, it is on our website, the entire packet's on our website. So if you wanted to refer anybody to it, it would be there. Thank you very much. Commissioner Tolis. I would also like to thank uh, Director Loria for all the work he put into that report. Uh, we also had, uh, most commissioners had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him where uh, he answered questions and went over the report. Uh, which I think under Governor Wimmer, some of the policies she had put in there that, that our city's already implementing these policies. And again, I want to thank him for that work. Uh, 
Yeah, I would, I would echo some of the comments from my fellow commissioners. Um, we did have some, some internal meetings with Director Loria earlier in the year, and uh, this report really reflects some of those conversations that we had and some of the concerns that I brought up personally about how are we going to adhere to the governor's executive order. And I was really comforted by the fact that our city uh, was already sort of practicing many of those and in, in a position to really fall in line and, and be ready to be um, a leader in, in police you know, reform. And uh, obviously there's some, some, some more outstanding issues with M. Coles. And uh, I know the conversations with the human rights uh, group and the diversity group are ongoing. And there's obviously some issues that are still in the works to be worked out and <laughs> probably some issues that maybe um, we'll see, you know, further down the line in the future. But um, I would like to thank our director Loria for his work and also all of our officers uh, for being a role model in the community and, and being a, a department that uh, I think gets a lot of attention, at least lately here at the commission, but um, it's also it's it's positive attention because we're finding out that we have a good police department and it's reaffirming to the community, especially given our community that is very transient. We have people from all over the country and the world. And so it is good to be reaffirming our position as a leader. And uh, so I appreciate that. And uh, thank you very much. Um, all right, I think we can move on. Uh, consent calendar items or items on the agenda. Oh, Commissioner, Commissioner Tolis, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did, Mayor. I have one question for Manager Ridley. Under sure. item five uh, minutes for the Traffic Control Committee, uh, was was there a short report that was in the packet for that? Um, yes, there it is. Let me see what page it is. It is page 14. It's just a half page document that says traffic control committee minutes at the top of it, right before the minutes of the planning commission, right at the end of the investment report. Okay, I thought I didn't have it in my packet because I was going over the audit stuff this morning and missed it, but it's in there. So. Yeah, it's just a short one is why. Yeah. Yep, I see it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Commissioner Gillis. Do we have any report of how the shutting of Broadway is working out for downtown? Um, from the, I, I know it's been, what, three weeks now, but are they going, I thought they were, and Correct me if I'm wrong. I thought they were going to review that every couple of weeks. Yes, Commissioner Gillis, you are correct. We are reviewing it every couple of weeks. Um, and the feedback that we've been receiving to it has been extremely positive. And as a matter of fact, I can't readily think of any um, feedback that we've received at the staff level that's opposed to it and we keep making adjustments to it as time goes on. The most recent adjustment I think you maybe noticed is the picnic tables were painted right. and some umbrellas were put up to make it more of an inviting atmosphere, thinking that might pe make people more comfortable sitting there and hanging out there for a little bit longer. And as businesses continue to open up more, some of them continue to have more plans to use more of that space, um, but they've been busy trying to figure out just how they open up the little bit they could, but I see them starting to expand even more so. So we are reviewing it internally every two weeks to make sure it's still meeting the goals. Um, and so far it has been very positive feedback. Um, so if you are hearing anything about it, I would certainly appreciate it if you could pass that on to it. So we, to me, so that we can take that into consideration as we do that bi-weekly review as well. Okay, thank you. Got some hands shooting up. Uh, Commissioner Tolis? 
Yes, uh, Manager Ridley, we talked about this at the last meeting and in this input, are we uh, contacting business owners in that area and getting their input? Um, we've asked, it, when we announced it, we asked the business owners if they had any feedback to be sure to let us know. And then I'm fairly sure Michelle has stopped in at some of the businesses to specifically ask for some of that feedback. Um, and at the merchants meeting that was held last month that was brought up. So we've been doing it in a number of ways to ask for that input from those property owners and business owners. Okay, because I've, I've got some comments from two or three that are really opposed to it and uh, claiming that their revenues are dropping, you know, street closure and would like it open back up, so. If you could encourage them to contact myself to share some of that information, that would be very helpful to know, Commissioner Tolis. Absolutely, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ronan? Um, I, I just wanted to share, um, I, you know, I was downtown Saturday and they had the, um, I, I think I was shopping outside or whatever the term is they use for it. And it, it was just wonderful to see all the people in the street. There, there had to be um, 50 60 people or so, all going to the different sidewalk sales and the shops, they're all masked and, you know, appropriate. But I mean, it was just, it was really nice to see some life down there on a weekend. And um, uh, I know it's a pandemic and it's hard to organize it all, but I mean, I just wanted to share that it was, uh, it was just really nice to see. Okay. All right. Um, well, we can move on now. Um, to the consent calendar, consent calendar items are items on the agenda with an asterisk next to them. Are there any items that need to be removed from the consent calendar tonight? I don't see any hands up. I see Pete's hands up, but I think that's from our from the last. I'm thing sorry, in. I didn't take that down. Sorry about that. That's all right. Thank you very much. Um, all right, then, uh, Manager Really, would you go through our consent calendar? Yes, we have four items for you tonight on the consent calendar. The first is the approval of the minutes of your regular meeting of July 13th. The second one is to recommend that you approve an easement with Consumers Energy. And this is for some relocation of some of the electrical infrastructure due to the construction of 410 West Broadway. And Consumers is requesting an electrical easement on part of parking lot 12. And for a better reference, parking lot 12 is the parking lot that's at the southwest corner of Broadway and Oak Street. And the easement document has been reviewed by the city attorney and we're recommending you authorize the mayor to sign it as presented. Um, next, we're asking you to consider a resolution to support a grant request from the Michigan Arts Council. And this would be for a $2,500 mini grant to be used in 2021. And it would provide the funding toward the painting of three intersections in broad, on Broadway Street downtown. As you know, we've done this in prior years and it has been very well received, not only for the looks of it, but also for the community involvement that we get in those painting weekends when that takes place. So we're recommending you approve the resolution as presented. And then the fourth and final item is the approval of payrolls and warrants. Commissioner Tolis. I'll move to uh, approve the consent calendar as presented. Commissioner Gillis. Second. Any discussion on the consent calendar? Seeing none, uh, we'll go for a roll call vote on approving the consent calendar. All right. Commissioner Elsegger. Yes. Commissioner Gillis. Yes. Commissioner Lalone. Yes. Commissioner Ronan. Yes. Commissioner Tolis. Yes. Vice Mayor Pershbacher. I didn't. I didn't hear it come through again. Yes? Okay. And Mayor Joseph? Yes. Motion passes. 
All right, very good. Um, next on our agenda is item number 10, which is a public hearing on an ordinance to amend portions of chapter 50, our solid waste ordinance and consider approval of the same. Um, Major, really, did you wanna give an overview before we go into the public hearing? Just a couple of brief comments, Mayor, as a reminder. Um, this ordinance change is based on our work session discussion that we had earlier this year. And if approved, it would allow for additional trash collection options, primarily for duplexes and triplexes throughout the city, because they would be able to use a cart system through um, Republic Services, who is our trash hauler under certain circumstances. And it would also allow two and three family units that are part of larger complexes to choose their preferred method of trash disposal. And then, as I mentioned at the last meeting, it also cleans up the language in many sections to help read it more clearly. And so we believe these changes would address the concerns that were brought forward by providing effective methods of trash disposal in units such as this. So after holding the public hearing tonight, we recommend you approve the ordinance amendments as presented. And assuming that is done at your next meeting, we would bring forward the recommendation for the actual trash cart fees and the required extension to the contract with our solid waste vendor. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will now open the public hearing. And it uh, does not look like we have anyone from the public. So I will close the public hearing and uh, move that uh, move to approve the updated chapter 50 ordinance. Mayor, I would just mention real quickly, I did verify that no public comments came in um, through the email system and none did just to confirm that. Okay, thank you, Mayor, for that. So I would entertain a motion to um, approve the updated chapter 50 ordinance. Commissioner Ronan? I move that we approve the updated chapter 50 ordinance. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Elsager. I will second that motion. Thank you as well. Uh, and I will open up the floor for discussion. No, Commissioner Elsager. Um, it appears to me that as usual, when we've asked our city staff to put in some work and come up with something that they did a real good job. And I think this is something I can easily support. I would echo those comments. I think, um, you know, we were brought a problem in, you know, in our city with the ordinance was brought to our attention by a couple of um, landowners and landlords and uh, we acted, uh, I think, in a professional and, and swift manner to address those issues. And so I'm proud of the work there. Um, and being no other hands up for discussion, I uh, should bite my tongue. Uh, Commissioner Tolles. I want to thank staff for expediting this matter and get it resolved uh, very quickly. Uh, that's all. And I will be supporting it. Vice Mayor Kirschbacher, did you have your hand up? No? Okay. Uh, Manager Ridley? Yes, I was just going to comment, Mayor. Um, this is the first major ordinance rewrite that Jason Moore has done as our Director of Public Works, and he took the lead on this one. So I just wanted to publicly recognize him for his work on it because it was his first one, and I think he did a stellar job on it. Yes, thank you, Jason. Um, you know Jason for several years and he's always done a really good job whatever he puts his mind into it seems so thank you um, I guess with that we can go to a roll call vote to approve the chapter 50 ordinance re revision yes Commissioner Tolis yes 
Commissioner Ronan? Yes. Commissioner Lalone? Yes. Commissioner Gillis? Yes. Commissioner Alsager? Yes. Vice Mayor Birschbacher? I, I, I can see you saying yes, but for some reason, I don't think we're hearing you, so. Okay, there must be something. I, I see you nodding your head, so the yes. And Mayor Joseph. Yes. Um, okay. All right, next on our agenda is item number 11, which is to consider a contract amendment for the remaining sites in East Point 4 as recommended by the property committee. And um, I, I guess I would ask Manager Ridley, did you have any comments before maybe I hand it over to the chair of the property committee? Nancy, you're muted. Sorry about that. I'll start out and then Commissioner Alsager can chime in. Um, you'll recall that earlier this year, you approved an amendment to the land contract with Mr. Olivieri to allow additional time for the construction of the last two houses for lots on Batson Street that he purchased from the city under a land contract. And that extension was partially based on Mr. Olivieri's commitment to recommend a change to the zoning ordinance regarding garage placement, which was a, an important factor for him. So the extension allowed enough time for that recommended change to make it through the consideration process of both the planning commission and the city commission. Unfortunately, shortly after that, the stay home, stay safe executive orders were issued and things were temporarily put on hold. So once that stay home order was lifted, Mr. Olivieri began completing his work with the Home Builders Association and they are finalizing a recommended change to the zoning ordinance that they will be bringing forward to us. Um, so he then met with the property committee to ask for an extension of the land contract so that there would be adequate time to consider the zoning change and to um, begin construction. Um, some of us as staff members are scheduled to meet with Mr. Olivieri and representatives of the Home Builders Association yet this week to receive and react to their recommended change to the zoning ordinance. And after that, it will begin to go through the consideration process at the planning commission level. So based on the timing of that, the stay home orders, the property committee is recommending that this third amendment to the land contract be approved, which would allow Mr. Olivieri additional time to have the zoning ordinance amendments considered and then construct the last two homes um, and the default provisions of the prior contract would not change other than he would have a few additional months before those default provisions would set in. But other than that, they would stay the same. So I believe the property committee is recommending approval of this third amendment that was drafted by the city attorney. Um, thank you, Mandy, really. Uh, did you have any uh, comments about the um, deliberations of the property committee? Well, we felt that um, Mr. Olivieri did a very good job, you know, presenting the reasons that he had been unable to um, comply with the previous um, changes. So we thought it was only fair, especially given the constraints of the pandemic, that we do grant this um, this extension. And Manager Ridley ex explained it very well. Commissioner Tolles? Yes, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to authorize the Mayor and City Clerk to sign a third amendment to the 2013 Real Estate Purchase Agreement with Mr. Oliveri as drafted by the City Attorney. Thank you for the motion. Commissioner Ronan? I'd like to second that motion. And I'll open up the floor for discussion. Commissioner Alsager? Well, I just wanted to um, say something, especially because Commissioner Gillis was um, very strongly against us making this move. 
And so I was listening very carefully as the request was made. And I do think that we're being very fair to this builder to grant this request um, for another amendment. I do think we're being very fair. I, um, I'll be supporting uh, this third amendment. I think, um, you know, when we made the, the amendment, I believe it was earlier in the year, we were in a different circumstance and we were giving some, some time for Mr. Olivieri to, uh, to build and to, you know, find ways that he could conform to the zoning ordinance uh, because he's been building, he's had that contract with the city for um, several years. And so sort of, I, I have empathy for him at the, you know, sort of the later stages of that contract that some things in the zoning ordinance were changed and that it affects how he had to build. And uh, obviously no one could have predicted that we were going to go through a pandemic and it's a public health crisis that has also turned into a financial crisis. And so um, I think the recommendation from the property committee is fair to those conditions. Um, obviously our local economy and our, our economy everywhere has seen a, uh, a huge hit. And so um, to give him an extension to fulfill his obligation to the city, I think is the right uh, choice. Seeing no other discussion, I think we can move to a roll call vote on the amendment to the contract. Right. Commissioner Lalone. Yes. Commissioner Ronan. Yes. Commissioner Tolis. Yes. Commissioner Allsager. Yes. Vice Mayor Gillis. No. Mayor Pershbacher, Vice Mayor Pershbacher. For the yes. Okay. And Mayor Joseph. Yes. Um, so, AB, I know, not to put the spotlight, but are you not you're not able to talk at all right now? Because we, we can't hear anything you say. Okay. I'm just worried that my if you want to talk on any issue, that's that's a tough. Maybe uh, when we take a recess, Mayor, she could um, log off and log back in and see if that takes care of the issue. Yeah. Okay. We'll go. We'll try that. That motion passed. Thank you, Jeremy. Apologize for interrupting. No problem. Uh, next on our agenda is announcements on city related issues and new business. Um, I guess I just wanted to, uh, I know we talked about it a little bit earlier, but the painting of the um, benches downtown, I thought really it looked really nice. And it definitely adds a more welcoming atmosphere. Um, the TIFA board met this morning and there was a light discussion on uh, that closed down district and, and seeing how that's affecting some of the businesses. And we did have some, uh, some, some tweaks probably recommended by some of the members, but overall the discussion was positive. And I was also downtown on Saturday and I went to the farmer's market and went through the sidewalk sales. And it was, it was as Mr. Commissioner Ronan said, it was a very positive experience. A lot of people were out. Um, it was a happy scene. Uh, and it was nice to see those things in light of all the things that we're dealing with as a society currently. Um, with that, I will hand it over to uh, Commissioner Gillis. Yes, um, I would like to encourage our community members to continue to wear and don your favorite mask, whatever that may be, and continue to respect and consider others when you are in a, yay, in a public forum. Um, this is the only time that we hopefully will have to um, uh, deal with a pandemic in our lifetime. I hope not to see one of these again, but um, I also want to acknowledge the public announcement that Director Laria did for our different uh, social media avenues. I, I think uh, 
everyone has to realize when we want to get back to football games and we want to get back to school and we want to get back to work, this is something that everyone has to do and show to our other fellow community members that we are just as concerned with their health as we are our own. And one way to present that to everyone in our community that we care about one another is to wear a mask when you're in a public forum. So I appreciate everyone that's doing it. And I, we have 100% compliance so that we can eliminate some of the trends and see the, the counts reduced and we can get back to somewhat normalcy uh, after a pandemic. Um, I also want to encourage everyone to vote next Tuesday at our primary election. All the precincts will be open. And if you have asked for a absentee ballot, um, we were all sent to applications. You can return those applications or you can take a picture of those applications and send them in to Jeremy, and then he will send out your absentee ballot. I just want to give clarification on when the last dates that would be possible because we're coming down to 11 days worth and when the last mailing can go out for an SD ballot or the last mailing for an application. I know we have to ask this within the small building so that if you're coming out to a time crunch, you can still drop in the box. But you can please clarify me what those timelines are for the next 11 days. Yeah, sure. Um, the uh, last day that we can mail something out is now the Friday before, so I think it's 5 p.m. on Friday before the election, so this coming Friday. But uh, you can come in Saturday. We'll have office hours from, uh, let's see, 8 a.m. until 4 p.m., so you can come in in person and actually vote your ballot right there, get everything taken care of on Saturday. And then that's always before every election, we are always open on that Saturday. And then you can even come in on Monday and still request and vote your ballot uh, in person. We can't send it out. We can't let you leave with it, but you can still vote in person on Monday as well before the Tuesday where you would have to do it in the precinct. And Jeremy, isn't it true that the ballot has to be received by August 4th, that there it cannot be postmarked, correct? Correct, yes. You have to have the ballot turned back into uh, the clerk's office by 8 p.m. on Tuesday. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. You're welcome. And actually looking at the calendar, it's less than 11 days, isn't it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> A week from tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I apologize, I was muted. Uh, Commissioner Tolis. Thank you, Mayor. I just uh, also wanted to commend Director Loria on his PSA uh, announcement, and hopefully he'll stay in a position he is and not go into a broadcasting shop. <laughs> hopefully we pay better. <laughs> so. Commissioner Elsager. I had a question from one of our city residents. I think he was noticing the wonderful street lining, um, pavement lines that were being done on some of the local, uh, sta the state roads. And he was asking me if there's a schedule for doing that for our city roads. And I didn't know the answer to that. So I thought this might be a a good time to ask some of our experts about painting the lines on city streets and how that is prioritized or done. Yeah, that, we've got that project scheduled uh, for the end of next month, end of August. Um, and we do roughly half of those every year. So uh, every other year they'll get done. Some, some streets, if there's really heavy traffic, they'll get done more often than that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Uh, without any more hands up, uh, 
Commissioner Tolis, you have your hand up? Yes, Mayor. Quick question for Jason. Are we on schedule, Jason, for uh, the Brown Street reconstruction? Or how are we doing there? Yeah, I believe that project is on schedule um, as far as what we expected out there. So they haven't run into any snags or anything. Okay, thank you. Great. Next on our agenda is public comment on agenda or non-agenda items. And I will open up that public comment section. We do not have anyone from the public in our meeting. Uh, Manager Ridley, was there any comments uh, emailed to us? No, Mayor, I have not received any written comments. Okay. Well, I will close the public comment section. And we have uh, we have a work session tonight to discuss the charter committee recommendations, but let's recess for about five minutes and we will continue our work session when we get back. Yeah, I, I think uh, Commissioner Pershbacher is trying to log back in. Amy, if that audio doesn't work this time, you could stay logged in the way you are and then use the phone number to call in and you could do use the phone to have the audio if your computer audio is not working.
Do you want to try talking, Amy? Can you hear me? Yep, this time it worked. Good. Okay. I just thought you guys were silencing me. It happens. <laughs> Trying to censor me. I get it. Can we do that? <laughs> Whatever. Hey, Paul. Um, is your coffee still tasting the same? Because I'm a little concerned about whether or not you guys are doing a good job with good tasting coffee there. <laughs> yeah. No, no, we're, we're, uh, uh, yes, our coffee is tasting the same. Okay. Right, I think we have everyone back, and um, oh, spoke too soon. Okay, I think we can get back to uh, our work session. Um, as you may know, uh, the Charter Committee um, has been meeting over the last year, and uh, we reached an agreement on several different topics. Um, we conducted the CARS report, and that, that was a presentation earlier in this year. Um, and then we, we looked at a couple of different policy proposals, including uh, the election of the mayor, um, and then we looked at the uh, term, the term of office for city commissioners. And we also drafted a policy on how things get on the agenda. And um, in the packet, you can see uh, the CARS report and also sort of a detailed analysis of what we looked at and our recommendations uh, on those topics. And um, Major really, did you have any um, comments on? Uh, I don't think so, Mayor, other than to say we're just looking for direction on those four questions so that we know what to keep working on to bring back to you for formal action. Okay, thank you. And so really, I think um, where we probably should start, um, there is probably the easy one is maybe the, po the, the draft of the policy for getting things on the agenda. And I was wondering if anyone had any um, comments, questions, uh, if you're in general support of the policy that was drafted. So we don't see any hands up. <laughs> Basically, the, the policy is outlining how things get to the agenda. And I think that's been a concern um, from some commissioners. I think especially it comes from commissioners maybe in their uh, who are newer because they want to understand how things get to the discussion table. Um, and usually, I think you see, you know, people are elected to office usually on the basis of that they want to do things at the city commission level. And, and so that was a draft policy. And if really no one has any 
um, strong opinions or comments, I think we can um, probably go ahead and say that we're okay with that policy. And really the policy isn't anything earth shattering. It's, it's pretty much uh, just a formal document to say how things get um, to the agenda, so. Um, the next, I guess, item would be Mayor, the- I would, I'm sorry, Mayor. What I would just say on that is, um, if you don't have any comments on it, we would bring that to your next meeting for formal approval so that it shows as a formally approved policy. Okay. Thank you. I have a quick question, sorry. Yeah. Um, so is this policy going to make it so that anything that is placed on the agenda has a agreement of four commissioners to be placed on the agenda? Or I've seen times in the past where mayor and vice mayor has decided to put something on the agenda um, Benotes to the rest of the city commissioners or some of the city commissioners that weren't in the loop and was hoping that if we are going to put policies and what's going to be on the agenda, if it's going to come through a work session or just so that it isn't initiated solely by the vice mayor and the mayor deciding. No, so so Lori, the, 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 the policy really outlines that Things get to the agenda off uh, a collection of different things, either um, issues probably raised by the community, recommendations by staff, um, yep, you know, I read items, it. items that come up. Also, it, it also uh, makes pretty clear that um, obviously the mayor and the vice mayor and the city manager meet at the um, agenda setting meeting, but that other commissioners certainly can recommend things to the city manager to bring up for discussion. And so it, it has no requirement of for votes or any votes really at all for things to get onto the agenda. So if a single city commissioner wanted to discuss something and asked to have the item placed on the topic placed on the agenda, that would be possible if they had some information they wanted to share or have discussion. I think it, I think what the policy really allows is, or says is that it, it at least initiates that conversation. Um, I know in times past there have been things where um, a commissioner has brought up an idea that wasn't considered and it was sort of maybe in the announcements or new related business and we sort of looked for, hey, is there general support to talk about this at a later time? Um, I don't think the policy specifically addresses that issue. Um, I think it was more of a general document, but- I maybe. guess one other thing I would mention, Mayor, is typically at the staff level, if, some, if a commissioner brings something forward that's going to take a significant amount of staff time, and it's not something related to one of the commission goals or one of the things that we've talked about in work session, that typically I would um, generally not have a lot of staff time put into something to have it put on the agenda if it's just one commissioner that's asking for it. In that circumstance, I would generally ask that the commissioner bring it up to the group as a whole, either under announcements or in a work session to make sure there's general interest in that topic before we spend a significant amount of staff time. So I would say, Commissioner Gillis, that that is possible to have happen, but if it's gonna take a lot of staff time, it's not likely to happen because I would bring it back to the full commission before I would spend a lot of time on it or have any of the staff spend a lot of time on it. Okay, thank you. Yes, I think that's a really good clarification. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for that question as well, Commissioner Gillis. Um, so I think the next thing uh, we should probably talk about is the um, related to the recommendation of the mayoral election process. And as you have read, the Charter Committee recommended that in accordance with also changes in the term of office of city commissioners that the 
the mayor is still an appointed position by the commission. Um, if we elect to do a charter change to change the term of office to four years, the um, obviously the term would change, but I think we should first just talk about the selection of the mayor and if um, general input on that recommendation. Commissioner Gillis. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm disappointed about the recommendation from the charter committee. Uh, I, it, it's, it's not surprising at all, but I am very disappointing because I pretty much thought that this is how that would come down with the, the three appointed people on the charter committee. I have had several community members talk to me about elected mayor and from the reports from the cars out of the municipalities interviewed, there were more municipalities that had an elected mayor by their community members than didn't elect their mayor that had a council um, elected mayor. So from comparison, which was what the whole cars I thought research study was about was to compare to other municipalities to see if anybody had some reservations and everybody read the same packet about how their the in the results from the cars research was there was more engagement when you had a publicly elected mayor you had people that were more in tune on what the city commission commissioners who they were and they probably felt more engaged by us because we were allowing them to choose their mayor to represent their, themselves and our community. Now, I, I want to take the time that if we were to put this up to a vote, a citywide vote, uh, we are just asking our citizens, re, citizens re, our community members <laughs> that what they think about this issue. We're not, we're not doing it, we are asking for their input. And I also think it's a way to engage them more to the point that they are watching the city commission, they are asking uh, who would be the best ones to represent. And for my time on the city commission going on the fifth year, Elected mayor has always been whoever held the majority or four votes. Um, many times it didn't even matter who I was going to elect or, or who I would vote for for mayor because it had already been decided by a four person majority on our seven person committee. So you're not engaging all the city commissioners when you're electing a mayor. Um, pretty much on partisan lines. I have seen them, at least when I have been on the commission and previously when I was um, aware of, of these types of uh, political partisan elections that I have never seen a mayor selected that was from the minority party, which is supposed to be a nonpartisan board but it never really happens that way. It's always usually, well, it's always been since I've been watching political life that uh, it's always been whoever the majority party, uh, the majority party on the seven commissioners, they elect, elect a member within their own party. It is not necessarily the best suited person. Um, it is just because they all, we all, they all fall in line under party party lines. And, and that's the biggest problem I have with the city commission is because we are nonpartisan. Uh, if we were separated into precincts where each precinct, like our county commissioners, then had a Democratic candidate and a Republic candidate and everything was out in the open and transparent, I would feel more comfortable with that. Uh, allowing council, I, I, no, I, I take that back. I still always want to put the power of elected mayor with the people. And I think it would engage them more. 
I think it would bring him into the system and the political system to uh, keep informed on what we're doing. Um, from the results of the cars, it even went into the animosity or maybe even the repercussions if you don't vote for someone and they expected you to vote for them. Um, there is a lot after the new year and a mayor has been selected, there's been a lot of partisan uh, politics being played, a lot of animosity, and that would be completely removed if we allowed our public community members to vote for elected mayor. That would completely remove that stigma of us, them, or some of us not even being engaged in a conversation of who to elect for mayor. Because in the past, if you've had four votes, you did not have to engage the other three commissioners. You didn't have to ask their opinion. You didn't ask, have to ask if you know they felt that someone else would be suited. Uh, the four people that had the majority had the majority, and that was the end of the discussion. It disenfranchises the other commissioners that weren't in the privy conversations of the four majority who decided to um, uh, decide on a mayor. So I really think this goes against our, uh, our democracy um, from the results from other communities who have elected mayors. And I've talked to other commissioners from other communities that have elected mayors. And it makes me feel very comfortable that that would be the right thing to do is, and again, this just puts it to a citywide vote. This does not decide anything but asking our public community members what they want to see. Would they like to participate in the selection of our mayor and who would represent our, our city? So I think it's only fair to allow them to imp have their input I think this election, because it's going to be an overwhelming amount of people coming out to vote in November, would give us a really good a sense of, it's going to be definite what way the community members uh, want this to happen. Um, this was, could I clarify something real quick? I'm sorry to interrupt you. No but problem. If, we, if it were on a ballot for the electors to decide you would then be obligated to do it that way. Sure. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that you, everybody understands it can't be an advisory vote. If that were on Absolutely. the ballot and it passed, that is how the mayor would be elected from here until eternity unless the charter's changed again. Right. Okay. I, yep. And I, I am totally for power to the people. I think uh, we, we have a better engaged community and we would probably have a better working commission if the mayor was selected by the community instead of along party lines or partisan backdoor communications. Um, I've been left out of a, a lot of different votes in that manner. Um, I can tell you personally how it felt. It, it did not feel like I was part of the commission. It set me a tone when um, someone is saying I'm, I'm better suited as mayor and uh, so I bear, very well feel like that would not be an issue any longer if community members were selecting our mayor. And we would have to then uh, reach out to all our community members on both sides. We would elect a mayor who is nonpartisan that way, which is what our board's supposed to be, nonpartisan. And then you would have to uh, vet, or you would have to get votes from both parties, both, hopefully, that's what you would be trying to do. You would probably try to reach out to community members as a whole, rather than within your own party. Um, I also have a lot of reservations when people that are uh, mayor and vice mayor that are elected on executive boards of their party. They're kind of doing a double role. They're um, obviously deep into their party, um, being elected to the executive boards of their party. And then they are also on being mayor and vice mayor on a nonpartisan commission. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that serves all of the public, which we have publics. Our community members are independents. They are Republicans. They are Democrats. And if you allow them to speak 
I think not only will we have better selections of mayors, we will in turn have better people deciding to run for commission. So um, I, I was really hoping with the uh, research uh, last year, uh, it's too bad the vote didn't come up last year. We may have had a few more commissioners that have left that were at least um, not publicly, but behind the scenes saying that they were in favor of elected mayor. So I, I would really hope that we'd reconsider this and put it up to a citywide vote this November just to get a read and a pulse on our community members and what they would like from an, uh, our mayor. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gillis. I would um, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, all, all our members here on this board are citywide elected. And so, um, as you said, you know, the mayor would also be a citywide vote. And I think that, um, I think as the chairperson of the charter committee and obviously as serving as mayor, I, my experience has been that um, if we change to an elected mayor, it would sort of change, I think, the expectation of the role. And also I think um, the role as it is right now is you're one of seven. I, I don't think that I bring to the table, you know, be, I don't think because of my position that, um, that I have a lot more authority than anyone else. In fact, um, it's more of a, you know, especially during the meetings, I'm, you know, it, the mayor position is to run the meetings and more of an empire sort of role in terms of, you know, recognizing people and keeping us on track. Um, and so I think, I think sort of, you know, my opinion is that the appointed mayor is, fits the role a little better. Um, and I think the animosity between commissioners that, that is presented between, you know, when you have some people who are, you know, elected and some people who are, you know, upset that they weren't chosen as mayor or vice mayor, I think um, that is unfortunate. I do, I do think that is uh, one of the, you know, uh, less, less, you know, feel good um, outcomes of, of having an appointed mayor. Um, but I do think in overall, I think if we were to change to an elected mayor, it would change the expectation and it would change the role in a way that we'd be headed more towards uh, maybe a strong mayor system instead of a city manager, city council's form of government. And I really think that form of government has served this community really well for a really long time. It's the majority uh, way that municipalities in this state and others uh, decide to sort of govern themselves. And I think we really benefit from the expertise of, you know, a staff uh, that is professional and, and well-educated and really the mayor's position is is uh is more ceremonial probably than it has in actual power or authority i would say but at this well, time I, 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 sorry no, i kind of but i want to disagree with you for the fact that the mayor's position would not change at all except for the fact that you're elected by the people yeah, you would be given no more power. You would still run the meetings, uh, you know, and, and it still would be the manager uh, council form of government. The uh, municipalities that were interviewed have the same form of government that we have, and they still have elected mayor. Mm -hmm. So that has no bearing on um, an elected mayor versus a more mayor council or more mayor manager uh, type structure, but, uh, and I do disagree. I think the mayor does have a lot of power. I think he does uh, set the tone for the rest of us. Uh, he gets to make all the appointments to the committees at the beginning of the year. So like yourself, if you only wanted to appoint me to one committee member committee or uh, Commissioner Tolis to one committee and the rest of the gang to three, four and five committees or yourself to seven and then a couple more committees that you've appointed yourself to that's what i'm trying to avoid for future generations in this style of mayor elect 
that I, I think this, the citizens would be able to see someone who is going to put pol party politics aside and, and do what's right for the community as a whole. That would include Republicans, independents. And I, I got to admit, I was very disappointed and felt like it was retaliation when I was only appointed to one committee after five, uh, one term and going on my second term and, and one of the veterans of, of the commission. Um, I was put on the city C CMU liaison. That's the only committee. And I do believe that was um, in retaliation. So uh, I just think the animosity that arises from uh, more more than one people person that wants to be mayor, we could eliminate this completely and allow the community members to pick who they would want to be represented. Uh, and to somehow entertain the idea that the seven city commissioners no better uh, is, in my opinion, somewhat absurd. Um, I've, I again state that it has been along party lines and definitely in the past there has been times that the best person, and I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking in the past, the best person who did be here was not elected because they're from the other party. So, but I'm all set. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Commissioner Ronan. Yeah, I had my hand up for a while, actually. Um, look, um, I, we probably disagree about the survey the university did. I, I was quite disappointed with a 50% response rate. I don't know what they were supposed to do. And my take on it anyway is that it's much more balanced, uh, that I didn't find any um, clarity with that. The, the second thing is, um, in general, I'm more in favor of a... Uh, sort of a vertical power structure than a hierarchical. We can discuss that, but that's a personal thing. Um, what I talk to people about in terms of the mayor elected versus not elected, boiled down to they just wanted the city to get stuff done. So I don't think, I talk to a lot of people who had concerns one way or the other. What they wanted is for stuff to move in the city. And the question becomes, how can we enhance that? And I'm not saying stuff doesn't move in the city. But how could we enhance that so we get much more stuff done? And I think the other proposal we have really addresses that. And even if we went to a mayor system, I think we'd have to address the other two things first, to be honest. So, so I think the idea of talking about how the executive committee or the mayor's committee determines what's on the agenda, how it's voted on, is critical if, if we're going to sort of look at that process. So I think clarifying that. So I was really glad to see that. The second thing I'd like to talk about that was on the proposal is extending the um, amount of time commissioners are elected for. So going from three to four years. And I think if we put those things in place and we don't see the changes we want, then there's another stage. But, but I, view the, I, I view what the charter committee came up with as being a good step. I mean, everything's pol polarized now. So everything's politicized. Right. I, I mean, there's Democrats, Republicans, and you're with this or you're with that. I, I, I'm not so much a fan, but I do think if we look at the, um, the suggested changes of shifting from two to four years, we save $30,000 for the city. Um, we have more people participating in each election, right, which is a goal. And you can look at the charts that I hear. I think coming up with the policy for the uh, mayor's council, mayor's committee, um, and I think changing perhaps the term of the mayor to two years as opposed to one year in terms of the election, um, I, I think some of those things move us in the direction of being getting more force in terms of getting things through. With, with two commissioners um, who are appointed to the mayor's committee being able to vote on that. I, I, I just wanted to clarify that. So, so I hear what you're saying, Laurie. Um, when I talk to people, it wasn't so much, oh, we need a mayor, we don't need a mayor, it's just we need the city to move, get things forward, we need to make progress on things. And, and I think they become conflated in a way that I, I, I'm not certain is, or that's what I heard. I don't, anyway, I'll be quiet. <laughs> Commissioner Tolis. Uh, I got a quick couple of comments to make. Uh, I'm also leaning towards elected mayor by the citizens in uh, Mount Pleasant. Uh, I've lived here since the early 60s. I've watched a lot of the commissions over the years. There were a lot of business people that were on this commission. 
very successful business people, uh, and they aim to always get stuff done. Uh, when a problem arose, uh, they didn't hire uh, a company to come in for fifty or hundred thousand dollars to consult and solve a problem. Uh, the problem surfaced, and by the next meeting, they had it resolved. Uh, and this is not what's happening now. I mean, uh, and trying to go to a, a three-year to a four-year term, I, I just can't see it. You can't get enough people to apply now for a three-year term. So how are you going to do it for four years, George? I, you know, it, it's not going to happen. Seriously, it's, it's not going to happen. People don't even want to do it. They're so disgusted that they've just given up. And... Uh, God, I'm 65 and I've been in business for quite a long time. And I had a second guess to do this, but, you know, I was trying to get on here to accomplish something. And I'm just outgunned. Uh, you know, I bring things up, I bring up solutions to the problem, and stuff just doesn't seem to get done. Some of the stuff does and some doesn't. But this should be nonpartisan. Absolutely, this, these commissioners should be. But this commission is not, it's not partisan, seriously. And I don't know how you're going to resolve that, but you have to look at the track history for the last 50, 60 years. And I mean, you had many business people that were running it, that were the mayor, and definitely got stuff done. I mean, there were problem solvers. And... And it, it's, it's reversed. I don't know what the answer is, uh, but I'm trying my best here. But basically, I'm outgunned. Uh, you know, I've got one voice, and, and that's all. So I can, I can just put out what I want to put out with my research. And either you can agree or you don't have to agree. But I think to do an election, you know, by the citizens, give it a try and see if they want to do it. I Hopefully, hopefully you can give it a try and see if it works, but um, that's, that's just my comments on that, and uh, thank you. Commissioner Ronan? Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, uh, I should have taken my hand out. I, I understand the frustrations. I, I just view this as an intermediate step, right? And if you think about how we'd elect the mayor, I think going to a four-year term just makes it easier. But I, unless we're going to elect it every year or going the mass for two years just makes it easier. I mean, but um, you're right. I don't know what the, what we did is we took a look at how long do people typically serve on the commission? Because I, I think I've been very clear. I'm doing three years, right? So I can resonate to what you're saying, Pete. And the average person does about five years on the commission, if I remember right. Is, is that correct? Uh, it sounds right. Yeah, yes. okay. we looked back at commissioners who had served since 2000 and had completed their term. So those of you who are on the commission, we didn't include you in that average because we don't know how long you're actually going to serve. But the ones who have completed their term since 2000, the average length of service was 5.2 years. So it seemed I had the same concerns, Pete, about would someone run it for that long, but it seems like that's what people are doing now. So, so it didn't seem like a tremendous stretch, but um, uh, again, if you look at that, uh, just 30 seconds, I apologize. If you look at the number of people who vote, it, that's there, right? I mean, it's clear. When you look at the off elections, it ranges from 4% to 17% voting. When you look at the on-term elections, it ranges from 33 to 57% voting. So if you want people to participate, anyway, I'll be quiet. I, I'm sorry. I just, Oh, gosh, no, no. Good. It's all good. Uh, Commissioner Elsager? I, I want to apologize for leaving the meeting. It was unintentional. <laughs> so thanks for having me back on. No, I just wanted to tease George a little bit that maybe he was going to suggest that I should have been mayor since I won all those precincts. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, in my election, I won all the precincts. I won every precinct precinct and 500 votes at, at, over the second vote getter every precinct yeah. so so you and I are in a club on our own Mary there we are 
Um, but some of those averages, I think, um, because uh, Commissioner Holton and Commissioner Ling spent so many terms. Um, Commissioner Ling, I think, did 12 years. So. This one is the one that happened where there wasn't any challengers for the city commission. The, the people, the incumbents or the people that were running, there were two seats and there were only two commissioners. So in that order, a lot of people don't go to the polls because you have just disenfranchised most of our voters when, they, when you only have two seats and there's only two potential candidates. So um, I don't know if that's what happened in 2010 because 4% seems... Uh, 2011 was a 4%. I'm oh, sorry. okay. Thank you. Yeah, it was an off year. Right. Thanks, George. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> in, as far as four years, um, for as many, oh, probably 15 years now, when I've talked to people about asking them to run for city commission, a three-year obligation is long enough. And some of you that, like George, you're saying, I'm, I'm three years and, you know, that'll be my one term. Kristen, after her first year, had already decided not to rerun. After 12 months, I, I think it was in on your second year, Kristen, you had already uh, told the Morning Sun, I am not running again, because you had already, after 12 months of serving, figured you could only handle another two. Um, so I think by upping another year and saying, no, we want a commitment for four years from you, you are just disenfranchising, disenfranchising a lot of people I'm not running because I'm not going to commit to four years. I don't know where I'm going to be in four years. Uh, three years, you might be a little bit more palatable to say, okay, I'll, I'll throw my towel into the ring for three years. Uh, my reservations is, are I do not want city commissioners um, replacing a commissioner that can't fulfill their obligation or term. I want always our community members to be voting on their representatives. For instance, someone gets elected, let's say Kristen after her first year, after January, February, she said, I'm resigning. Well, we would be appointing a city commissioner. Um, and so I don't want us to have that obligation of making appointments to city commission because people cannot fulfill a term. I want that to be a decision by the people, uh, by the, our, our community members. And I think that might be more apt to happen when the terms have been extended to four years. Uh, everybody just put four years on your age and, and you can ask yourself, what am I gonna do four years from now when I'm 62? If I was going to commit to a, a term of four more years, I would be less hesitant to run if, if I was only going to commit to three. And everyone knows it's hard to get people to run. Mostly people that are not dug into the party where um, you're doing it through uh, the parties. I, I, I just feel that more people would act to throw their towel into the ring if they had an opportunity to be elected every year, uh, uh, an election every year, and for the fact that they would only have to commit to three years and we wouldn't be ex having extenuating circumstances where pe people are moving out of Mount Pleasant proper, they can no longer serve, um, things in life have come up, they can no longer serve, and then we end up appointing a city commissioner. I don't feel comfortable with doing that. So um, I'm also not really in favor of extending uh, terms to four years either. So, Thank you, Commissioner Gillis. Uh, Commissioner Laloon, you've had your hand up for a while. I also think four years is way too long. Shocker, but that is a very long time. Um, in my opinion, two years would be the best to do, but then you would never, it'd be a constant, you know, I don't know, it'd be a constant recycling of people probably, but, um, yeah, I would say four years is a little too long for me as well. I guess, um, 
I just want to reiterate, um, I think the four year idea was brought up because it would give more consistency, at least this is the, the motivation behind it, is that we would have more consistency in doing our long term goal planning. Um, you know, we ideally we every beginning of every year, we look at how we're going to uh, direct staff to spend the next year and to shape the budget. And if commissioners, if we have the same set of commissioners for at least two years in a row, it gives more time and more, um, I think, stable ground for some of those ideas to really get off. Um, when you have an election every year, it does have the potential to really uh, change the dynamic of the board, priorities change, and, and that happens. Um, I've seen it happen, you know, in my time and, and, and before when I was, you know, uh, just sort of a, uh, an onlooker on the commission. Um, I, do, I do understand some of the hesitations of going to a four-year, and I think the four-year would be a, you know, you would have an election of three commissioners every on one one term and then for the next and so you do have that that opportunity for a huge flip in the commission and so um it does raise you know the the ability for those those changes and dynamics to happen swiftly but it does give two years for the same group to sort of hash out um long-term goals and so that's my why i think that idea has my support. Um, you know, if you had told me running for the commission was a six year term or a four year term a few years ago, I probably would have maybe said, hey, I don't know if I can commit to being in Mount Pleasant for four years. I was still in college and wasn't really sure what my plans were um, for that period of time. Uh, and so I, I do understand the that reasoning and but I do think having the two years to have the same body really crank out issues and build um, some momentum on things, I, I think I sort of outweighs the risk. But uh, Commissioner, that's just my opinion. But Commissioner Ronan? I, I just want to reiterate that if you look at the numbers, it, it, it increases the participation rate by hundreds of percentage, percentage points, right? I mean, it, uh, and sometimes it quadruples the, the number of people who would uh, actually be involved in selecting commissioners. It also saves the city $30,000. Uh, and and there are other, I'm sorry? So you said 30, and I think you said that earlier, actually over a 10-year period, I think we estimated it would be about $65,000. I think it's fifteen thousand dollars an election. Is that what I remember? Is that fifteen thousand per election? Yes. Right. So fifteen thousand per off-season election, um, and I forget what I was going to say beyond that. But um, so I, I guess I, I'm in favor of going to a four-year um, a, a four-year stint, um, and then at you know, and, and you know, electing the mayor every year just doesn't make. I, I mean, I don't even know how that would. Yeah. I, I mean, I. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't even know how. I mean, I can't get my head around that. So I, I mean, I'd also argue that we change, and um, you know, go towards. Um, yeah, I think even if you're going to elect the mayor, I, I, I think you you wouldn't want to do that every year. Right. I mean, so I, I think this is just a movement in a direction to create some more stability. If, if at a later date we decided to uh, elect the mayor, then I could. Anyway, so I'll be quiet again. But but I understand everybody's concerns. I, I mean, I don't know. That... Commissioner Tolis. Well, one quick comment, uh, Mayor. Uh, this problem is not exclusive to the city of Mount Pleasant. Uh, uh, I served on the East DDA in Union Township for 11 years because uh, I have a business on Pickard Street. There's multiple businesses on Pickard Street, and nobody wanted to do it. I, I mean, and that's why I was on it for 11 years until they basically dissolved it, and then Township can't captured the funds and uh, took possession of the funds, but that was 11 years. Also, I was on the zoning board for eight straight years. Uh, you know, I loved it. Uh, I got on there. I learned quite a lot. And then I chaired it for about four years. Uh, I really enjoyed it. But it came to the point where uh, 
I was looking at some of the zoning stuff and I wasn't in agreement with doing what some of the commissioners wanted to do uh, because it wasn't in the ordinance. And I says, I'm, I'm not doing some of this stuff. If you want to change it in an ordinance and change it. But then all of a sudden, well, Jesus, uh, commissioner, you've been on this zoning board for eight years. You've got to get off now for a year. Well, great. I got off. And uh, like I said, I put, uh, you know, 19 years into this community and stuff has really changed. And, and I was hoping to do some good on here and accomplish a few things. And I got about another year and a half to try that. So I think you have been accomplishing things, Pete, and I think you have been doing good stuff, but I, I'm going to back off. I, I... Well, I don't see any. I see some hands up, but I think everyone has spoken who has their hand up is um, anyone who hasn't spoken. Um, Commissioner Mel, Com <laughs> Commissioner Al Sager. Um, just since I hadn't weighed in really other than um, rejoining the meeting, the since this would all take charter changes, it does put a different spin on it. It's hard to talk about one without talking about the other. Right. That's so it. I guess, yeah, I, I think that brings up a good point. And, um, you know, we are approaching close to an hour. And so I think we sort of have to see, uh, you know, where the consensus is in terms of changing the terms of office to four years, changing the election of the mayor to two year term, um, and I think in the report, it does recommend that the vice mayor is a one-year term. And I would actually recommend that if you're gonna do the mayor for two years, the vice mayor should probably be the same. Um, actually, mayor, the report recommends they both be two years. Okay, okay. Uh, Commissioner Lalone. I was just gonna say, if you want, we can give out, this is what, what I, as far as the consensus goes, um, I think four years is a little too long, but the research seems to support four years. So I'd be willing to support that to see. But yeah, obviously there's some down, there would be some potential downsides that I'm a little worried about, but I do think the research does seem to support that that would be good, so. Mayor, I just wonder for efficiency's sake, since we have been going for a while, if it might be worthwhile to ask each commissioner to weigh in on each of the three remaining issues, the election of the mayor, the four-year terms, and then the term of the mayor and vice mayor. That way you could get a feel for where everybody is on all three issues simultaneously. I think that's a good idea. Um, why don't we start with, um, we'll go in alphabetical order. How about that? Um, Commissioner Elsager, that would make you first. There we go. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that I've been convinced of a need for massive changes, but I do hear the arguments about four years, um, and having less cost to the city. I'm, I'm not sure that any of these moves would create more interest in serving. Um, and the last one, the term of the mayor, vice mayor, um, just seeing Will from, wat from watching, I'm sorry, um, Commissioner Joseph, that, you know, the idea that you know you started last year and this is your second year, you know, I watched a little last year and then seeing you in office this year, I really think you've grown in the office. So I do think two years is really good for that. Okay, so just to make sure, so you're you like the, the idea of a two-year mayor? Yes. And on the four-year terms, I'm. I can see that, that the research supports it, so I'm kind of going there. <laughs> okay. All right. And what about the election of the mayor by the voters instead of the commission? I'm I'm not 
I'm not as convinced on that one yet because I think we can see who can work well together. Okay. So next is Commissioner Gillis. Um, I don't know what the reference to the research from cars uh, sw swaying uh, our idea that a four year term or a two year mayor elect, they pretty much said disadvantages and advantages to all of those issues. So I, I did not get that from the report that that was a preferred term. That is what some of the municipalities were, were that was their term, but a preference of a four year term, I didn't read that in the, the research. So I am not for uh, elected mayor by uh, city commissioners. I would like to see that go to a citywide vote. I am also against a four year term. I think that will disenfranchise and make it harder for people to think about serving their community as a commissioner when we're asking them to extend four years. It's a long enough term for three years as some of the commissioners have, have mentioned. And I am not in favor of a two-year mayor, I think. If the mayor was doing such a fantastic job the first year, he would, auto, I would assume, automatically be elected for the second year. But if the mayor was uh, playing partisan politics or own agenda items or missing meetings or uh, not representing the community the way that I think they should, I would want to be able to not have that mayor for two years consecutively. So that would be no, no, and no. Thank you. Um, that makes me up next. Um, I am for the four years uh, terms, the two year mayor, and I am not in favor of the, the uh, properly elected mayor. Uh, Commissioner Lalone. I think two years is a good amount of time to be a mayor. I mean, you know, obviously reelected, but I think two years is good. I'm willing to go with the four years so that people, mm, I have a really hard time with that just because of my own personal experience that, um, but, you know, I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm still undecided about that. I'd like, I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm unconvinced, I guess. And um, I think it's better to choose the mayor from the commission. Cause like we said, we're all citywide elected and they don't see how doing a citywide, elect, so a citywide election for the mayor would be any less partisan. Like, I don't know how to make that not happen. Um, like if if the nonpartisan election for the commissioners ends up being partisan, I don't see how a mayor election is going to avoid that. So I think keeping it the way it is is fine. Okay. Uh, next, uh, Vice Mayor Birchbacher. Can't hear you, Amy. No. Do you want to sign off and sign back in, Amy? Okay. Hopefully it will just take a second because they can let her write back in. Right. And I'm a great lip reader, so I can translate <laughs> if she can't. <laughs> You're going to have one heck of a resume. My <laughs> friend, he might be leaving us. <laughs> Yeah, try it, Amy. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. You can hear me. Okay, because I'm I'm getting a little paranoid now. Okay, because I do <laughs> meetings all day long on this computer, and I come here, and you guys can't hear my voice. 
So I'm thinking the man is trying to hold me down. All right. <laughs> now, the reason why I'm not for the, I'm not completely against electing a mayor through the public, but the thing is, is I think that we need to try other strategies first. I think that a four year term um, is a reasonable because then you get more time on the board and we, you know, we shift, you know, three and four every, every general election. It saves the city money. Um, and I think that you're given a better avenue to, um, to make changes, to keep things consistent. Um, I think that a two year for the mayor is um is a good way to go also because i think that the first year that you're mayor unless you've been mayor before um the first year that you're mayor you're learning and i think the second year you you grow into it and you move forward so those are my um those are my thoughts on it uh commissioner ronan yeah i think if you look at the end of the cars report out of the 14 cities they cite, there isn't a single one that has a three-year term. They're all four-year terms except for one, which is a two-year term. They just weren't sure, so they said, we think it's a two-year term. If you look at the number of time, number of years the mayor serves, they're all two years. So, I mean, I, I support both those. Um, the idea that um, we go to a four-year term like all these other places do. Um, and nobody has a three-year term. We have a midterm election, right? Uh, the, I also support the two-year mayor term. Was there something else? And I, I don't support electing the mayor because I, I want to try this. I, I want to do this, see what happens, and be sort of slower on it. But I, no. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Tolis. Uh, I'm a four, four-year term. And as I've stated before, uh, I think it's hard enough to get people out of three years, let alone four years. As far as the mayor, two years, or the vice mayor, two years, uh, I think that should be one year and stay there. I've been here for 60-some years, and that's been the case. And uh, election by the voters I'm in favor of. Uh, I think uh, going to longer terms doesn't accomplish anything. If, if citizens aren't uh, don't approve your performance, let's put it that way, you're gone, they can vote somebody else in. If you're a good mayor or vice mayor, you're automatically gonna get voted in, just like uh, Commissioner Gillis said. But extending the terms, I, I don't see it. I really don't. Uh, you know, and as I said before, it's just tough to get people to, to do stuff anymore. It's, it's not like it was 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, and that's my take on it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Manager, uh, Nancy, did you need um, any more from the commission? Well, I think based on what I just heard in the notes I was taking as I heard it, that it sounds like it's worthwhile for us to work with the city attorney to draft the actual language that could go on a ballot to consider four-year terms for city commissioners and two-year terms for the mayor and vice mayor. But certainly that would have to come to you as a full commission for a formal um, debate on it and a formal vote. And the only way a ballot initiative can move forward is if I believe it's three fifths of you are in favor of that ballot initiative once you see the actual wording of it. Um, so it sounds like it's worth spending the time to have the ballot wording formalized by the city attorney based on what I've heard. And then we bring it to you for the official vote. Um, I should indicate that once that vote takes place, assuming it meets that threshold of three fifths, that then it has to go to the governor's office and the attorney general's office for review of the language before it can go on the ballot. So I'm not sure that can all happen in time for this November's election, but I think we should still, based on this discussion and all of the research that's gone into this over the last three years, we should still complete the process and get the language drafted and bring it to you for the formal vote 
so that if it is supported, that we can get it through the attorney general process and the governor process to have it queued up for a vote for next year um, instead of delaying it again. So I think that's what I'm hearing is our next steps is to work on those two pieces of it and bring it to you for a formal vote. Okay. I believe that's what we got. Um, Commissioner Gills. So it would not make it onto the ballot this year in 2020, but would possibly make it on the ballot for 2021. Um, yes, that's my belief, Commissioner Gillis. Okay, so we're going to put up a charter amendment, a change in our charter on an off election where you guys all just saw the percentages from the research of lower people uh, going to the polls in, in odd years. Hmm, that's kind of funny because if you really wanted a good representation, a good... Uh, idea what your community wants, I would think you would want to go on a year where we have high turnout, which would be this year, not an odd year. You just, we just, you just made um, arguments of odd years having low turnout, and then you're going to put a ballot initiative, ballot change on an odd year. That's yeah. very hypocritical. Well, I don't know that we would do it on an odd year. We could do it on the next even year. Well, that would probably be a better representation of what the community wants rather than, uh, you know, an odd year election, just because we saw the tables in, in the, in the report. So. And Commissioner Gillis, you bring up a very good point in that you took the words out of my mouth. That's one of the things I think we need to ask the city attorney about too, is once the commission approves ballot language and it's also approved by the governor and the attorney general, the part I don't know is how much time you have before it has to be put on a ballot. I don't know if there's any requirements of it has to be put on with a, within a certain period of time or not, but we can certainly find that out. So that way, when you do vote on it, you would know whether you could, whether you would be obligated to do it in 2021 if it passes or whether that could be deferred to 2022 if you chose to do that to keep it at an even year. So that's a great question that I don't know the answer to, but we can certainly find that out for you. Okay, thank you. Well, if the commissioners really want to get the pulse of the community, I would hope you kind of put your money where your mouth is and the, get the largest turnout during a presidential or a governor election. So rather than the few people that may go to the polls next year, I mean, hopefully this has instigated everyone to be a patriot and always vote. But um, yeah, this could be a change forever, right? So, but yeah, I would be very hesitant to put it on an off year just because of all the reasons of the other fellow commissioners of, of uh, seeing the turnouts in off year that we put a charter amendment on an off year. So thank you. Okay. Uh, I think that we've had a really good discussion tonight and uh, I'd like to thank the commission and staff for their time. And um, I think we can be adjourned here at 9.03. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Good night.